It's Torah Talk. 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 We are witnesses and watchmen of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. A Torah Institute podcast. Hey Mark, how you doing there? Good mate, how are you? Oh fine. What We're about having, this? What about We're this back here? Oh I know, this is so amazing, you know. Um, seeing amazing. this beautiful scenery and to think yeah. that a person might have to spend the rest of their life here? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? For punishment. <laughs> oh yes. What a punishment. That was, that was his punishment. We uh -huh. just get to sit here. We just get to sit here in a little coffee shop. Cheers, man. Oh, I don't have any coffee. Um, I'll have to oh, order some no, from no. the waitress. Oh, it's, you know, the service here is shocking, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Well, they're <laughs> slow at some tables. They serve you faster. <laughs> <clears throat> so why are we uh, in the Isle of Patmos, brothers and sisters? That's what we're looking at here. This beautiful scenery, the Isle of Patmos, where our hmm. Our brother Johannan apparently spent the latter years of his life, or did he? So, what's yes. the story behind that, brother? Well, that's a good story. Uh, we because you don't... you've said some pretty controversial things about yeah. uh, that brother, and yeah. I thought set it up for us. Well, why? I won't spoil the punchline. So. Uh -huh. Well, when you read the scriptures, that's where the real truth is anyway. We don't really get a name for the author of the book of John or the gospel of John. It's just not there. The only way you can infer who was writing it, if you really wanted to know, was to look at chapter 11. And that basically talks about the death of one of the, a brother of Mary or Miriam and Martha. Uh, because Yahushua was very close to this little family that, you know, lived around Bethany. And that was a place where apparently it was uh, somewhere on the um, side of the Mount of Olives, as we know it. You know, it's not that far away. But uh, Miriam and Martha and uh, their brother Eleazar, they call Lazarus in the Greek form of his name. Eleazar is his real name, that, and it means... Elohim helps. You know, that's what his name means. But he was very close to that disciple. And he was referred to in the scripture, in the book of John, by the term, the disciple whom Yahushua loved. And no other name is given for the writer other than that title. And anyway, uh, the I mean, his name is mentioned as Lazarus, in the text, in in the uh, in the uh, book of John, chapter eleven, and that's where you know you read about how he was in the tomb for four days, and Yahusha intentionally waited to the till four days had passed and he was in the tomb. Bec I think partly because the Pharisees uh, had the idea that the human be the soul left the body after three days, and there was no way that there would be any soul there or a being there, a spirit. But that was just uh, their teachings. And I think it was just a way of letting the, letting the bottom of that idea drop out. But uh, he's not, um, he, had a, he had a problem because this person they call Lazarus, the brother of Miriam and Martha, whose name was really Eleazar, the disciple whom Yahushua loved. We read about him. And then uh, in chapter C, 13, Yahushua is talking about, he's talking to his disciples and I think others, and he, he's saying, uh, he's talking about the signs of the end and then the tribulation and all that. And he stops and he says, some of those that are standing here will not see death until they see the reign of his father come in power. And uh, so we have that text. And then further along in chapter 21, we, well, it's actually before that too, 
there's a there's a scene where we read about at the Last Supper, you know, where it, they're all standing or sitting there, lying there, whatever, and um, the topic comes up that one of them is going to betray Yahusha. And of course, this upsets them, and they're all going, what? And so Kepha, they call Peter, signals to this person that we're talking about, Eleazar, the, the disciple whom Yahushua loved, that everyone calls John. To, he signals to him to ask him who it is. You know, I don't know if he was, you know, saying, who is it? Like that, you know, pointing. But it doesn't say that he spoke to, to, to Eleazar. It just says he signaled to him, to, made a sign to him to ask him. And uh, so then he leans over. This is a young boy now. He's lying on Yahushua's breast. You know, apparently they're reclining. And this young boy is lying on Yahushua's breast. He's a disciple whom he loves. And he says, who is it that's going to do this? And so, you know, and, and it's interesting because there must be a close relationship between the one we call Peter and John or Eleazar. There must be a close relationship, not only with Yahushua, but with Peter. Because in chapter 21 of the book of John, after Yahushua is resurrected, you know, they're, they're, they've had their little fish breakfast and they're walking along and, and Yahushua is side by side with Kepha or Peter and saying, you know, by the way, there's going to be a day that it's going to be unpleasant for you and I want to let you know about it. And he's talking about his death. And after he explains that he's going to die, and the method of his death. And he's, Peter says, he turns and looks at the one that's following, that's the disciple whom Yahushua loved, following behind them. And he says, well, what about this one? Because they're, they're bonded. There's the three of them. There's Peter, John, and Yahushua. And he says, uh, that's not of your concern. <laughs> you follow me. That's not your business, you know. So apparently Yahushua has some serious stuff involved in the life of this person that we call John. Some things that are very exceptional, you know. And it doesn't seem to be that he's dead. I mean, they, they can claim to have found a, a grave or whatever, but it's just not likely that that's happened because he was spoken to in the book of Revelation about a future time when he would have to be a, a, a witness a second time. To nations and kings and things. Anyway, it's interesting. It's an interesting uh, little story. But, and we could delve into the actual scriptures and read some of those. That would be good. Mm. You know, and I happen to have a copy of that right here. Yeah. So, are you, so was his original Hebrew name Eleazar or was it Ye Yehukanon? Well, uh, that's a good question. The sister our sisters, Miriam and Martha, and the brother that we read the name of as Lazarus, he wasn't named Lazarus. He was named Eleazar. That was a Hebrew name, um, as is Miriam, you know. And um, we have um, an, an understanding that, they, that he did change his name at some point, but we don't know when. Just like Shaul changed his name, you know, because they were seeking his death. And they were likewise seeking the death of Eleazar. And if, you're, uh, yeah, if you've got a crowd of people looking for you, and they don't maybe know you by sight, you can go, they, they look for you by name. And so he just probably shifted his name a little into Yahukanan or Yohanan, which we have inherited today as the corrupted form of uh, that Hebrew name, John. Now, Yahukanan is a Hebrew name too. And it is possible that he already had that name, but he started to use it more, you know, and uh, become known by it more. Now, the, uh, the reason, I mean, I know that Kepha had several names too, or Peter, Shimon. But how many names is that? That's three. <laughs> well, you know, so... They probably had more than one name, but he probably just adopted a name that was already his anyway. Because personally, 
I don't believe we have authority to change our own names because that's an authority thing that our parents do and we don't have authority over ourselves when we're born, you know. Yeah. But if yeah. we usurp the authority of our parents, which name is going to be written in the scroll of life, you know? If we hear our birth name call, we might not want to respond to it. Oh, well, That's I don't know about that name. That's yeah. very interesting. We want to keep our authority, uh, give Yahushua the, the ultimate authority. Yeah. If he renames us, you know, then he can. He will give us new names, maybe. Don't go, don't go changing a name, unnecessarily. Well, a lot of people yeah. do, you know, yeah. because they say, well, I have a scriptural name now, you know, mm. and they make up one and they that they like, you know. You just put if, that off. You just put the authority of your parents over you, no matter how they are or who they are, for a reason. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. Uh, Adam is the one who named his wife. Mm. You know. Yeah. It wasn't the wife that took a name and said, "Well, I don't like that name. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call myself Susie." Yeah. Um, or I'm gonna call myself by something more scriptural. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they had scripture, but. Uh, so you reckon when uh, when it's listed the disciples that followed Yahusha? And it says, uh, it says you you can doesn't it? You reckon, oh, it's, uh, El, you reckon he's changed it over through things that have gone on around Yahusha? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there would have been people coming after him all the time, wouldn't there? The trouble oh, sure. Yahusha was causing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we don't know. Him. Yeah, we don't know what the capital crime was that uh, that Elazar committed that made him have to get exiled to Patmos. But the traditional writing about him describes three attempts to boil him in oil. Usually the first one gets you. Yeah. you know. Funny about that. <laughs> it is like sort of funny about those things. But yeah. uh, I don't even know, uh, they didn't mention it uh, in scripture though about his death and they didn't mention about him getting boiled in oil but in the writings of the historians that were in the first, second, third, fourth centuries, we do get an echo coming down the line from uh, some of the historians that took things down, but you know The interesting thing though if you were locked away on an island as a penalty to die a, a, a natural death and the natural death never came along then uh, You know the people that had accused you and all their records would have been completely lost after several decades anyway you know, in fact, we can barely keep records for several decades, even now, uh, of individuals, you know, that are in the prison system or whatever, you know, but uh, unless there's a big to do about it, but, you know, usually the individual prisoners get lost in the, in the fog, you know, of history. And uh, the people that had uh, arrested him and taken him there and dropped him off, what if he didn't age and he just continued on? And then people were coming and going to the island and technology was getting a little better and uh, some wars happened and different empires rose and fall. Uh, and he's sitting there going, well, I guess it's time to get off. And of course, if you look at Patmos today, there's a huge fortress there. And it'd be interesting to see if he might still be there. I don't know. He could be, you know, and maybe that's his house, you know. Yeah. yeah. But uh, in fact, it, it even has an element of the name John in it, you know, the name of the fortress. If you go to the internet and you look up, oh, I think it's, uh, just look for fortress, Patmos, uh, you'll see a picture of this huge fortress and, and it's called Johanna or Johanna or something, something or other, and uh, a castle, you know. Hmm. Uh, so for people who are watching this just going, what? You're saying that what? you're saying that John is still alive. How can you declare something oh. like that? How can you sit in your little coffee shop in Patmos and declare that Elazar John is still alive? How can you do that? By the way, welcome to brothers. Welcome to Torah Talk, brothers and sisters. I'm Mark Davidson, and this is Lou White. Hello. And we're on Patmos. <laughs> it, as far as you know. <laughs> so. I get there eventually. It only takes me 15 minutes to say hello, but we get there. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you, Well, anyway... Look, you're not you trying to lay down dif a, a different doctrine here, are you, brother? We're just sort of saying what if. It's fun to say what if, isn't it? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we know Yahushua's coming back. We know he's not dead. Yeah. And uh, he's not some kind of crypt keeper. He's real. Yahushua can do anything. You know, he's... Oh, yeah. Now, if he can do that, yeah. Now, here's uh, one text that's written in Revelation, I think, chapter 10, starting around verse 11. He's talking to the writer of the book of Revelation, and the revelator is Yahushua. He says, you have to prophesy again concerning many people and nations and sovereigns. Now, that's an interesting thing. What? And then, then we have another text that's in Matthew, or Matthew 16, around verses 27 and 28. For the son of Adam is going to come in his esteem of his father and with his messengers, and then he shall reward each according to his works. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death at all until they see the son of Adam coming in his reign. And then we have at the, in the book of what they call book of John or Yahukanan, chapter 21, Yahushua tells Kepha what kind of death he's going to have to endure. And then Kepha asks Yahushua about Yahukanan concerning his, the, his, his death. And it says, And now Kepha, turning around, saw the taught one whom Yahushua loved, following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and said, Master, who is the one who is delivering you up? Seeing him, Kepha said to Yahushua, But Master, what about this one? Referring to Yahukanan, you know, or Eleazar. Yahushua said to him, if I wish him to remain until I come, what's that to you? Therefore, this word went out among the brothers, that this taught one would not die. Okay, that's scripture. Now, if, if that word went out among all the brothers, then why isn't it going around now? Because it's right there. They, they weren't idiots, were they? They weren't stupid. They no, were they were the master. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, you know, he may be walking around, uh, you know, somewhere bumping into people. And, uh, but his, his name is not Lazarus, it's Eleazar. It's just a, you know, they drop the uh, E in the, in the Greek, you know. It just started with the L, you know. That's the biggest point, I think, that blew our brains out. The fact that you had just taken two people... You've been you've grown up thinking are two separate people. One is a disciple, the other is a friend who died, and mm -hmm. Yahushua waited. And the the amazing story of that, how Yahushua wept and everything, and saw the state of the people and their sorrow, and and then raised him up. Amazing story. I've seen movies about it, and mm -hmm. you're now saying that it's the same person. That's the thing that just is a mind melt. Well, this is something that has not been unknown. It's just that the ecclesiastical people have not really brought this out. Yeah. And they it isn't so important that we know that much about each other anyway. But Because, you know, if Yahushua were here today, he would not be offended by the fact that we're just revealing this. But the fact that we, if we put any stock in that and start looking for this person and hunting for him and waiting for him... I think he may be one of the two witnesses, though, and a lot of people agree with that, you know, that we have that possibility, you know, mm -hmm. but there could be more than, you know, one, one or two witnesses, I mean, of course, but there's two witnesses that are really special, and of course, we understand Moshe was a, a type of the wit a witness, and so, and so was Eliyahu, or Elijah, and then some people say Hanak, or Enoch, uh, might be, but the fact is, in the in the spirit of inspiration, I mean, text, the text of Scripture reveals that he is going to have to testify again concerning nations and sovereigns. And, of course, uh, he may be one of the two witnesses. Mm. So, if he is still alive, though, it would be amazing to, to, to know it because it, he was a witness to the resurrection. You know, and in fact, in one instance, we know that uh, Miriam, uh, Yahushua's mother, was given to Yahukanan as uh, 
for him to watch over and take care of. So when he was on the on the torture stake, Yahusha said, "Behold your mother," you know, to his good friend, and uh, that's a pretty important thing too. Mm. So, um, anyway, we have this one scripture at, at, in the book of John, chapter 11, verse thir- uh, 1 through 3. It says, And now a man named Eleazar, Lazarus, was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Miriam and her sister Martha. This Miriam, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the master and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Yahusha, saying, Adonai, or Master, the one you love is sick. And that was uh, an interesting thing. And then the disciple whom Yahusha loved, who is that? That's Eleazar, it says so. All you have to do is just do a little math, you know, to say, mm-hmm. well, it looks like they're the same person. They are. In fact, Miriam, Martha, Eleazar, they're all mentioned in that, in that same little section there in John chapter 11 in three verses. Mm-hmm. Now it says, meanwhile, a large crowd of Yahudim found out that Yahushua was there and came. Now this was after his death, of course, you know. And, uh, and it says, um, not only because of him, that not because uh, not only because of Yahusha, but also to see Eleazar. So see, Eleazar had bec- be, had been raised from the dead, uh, and he was becoming very famous. He was just as famous as Yahusha, or at least the next most famous person, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plan made plans to kill Eleazar, as well. On account of him, many of the Yahudim were going over to Yahusha and putting their faith in him. So the next day, a large, a great crowd had come for the feast and heard that Yahushua was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hoshanu, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahuwah. Blessed is the king of Israel." And that's in the 12th chapter of the book of John. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it, it might be that he's unbreakable. He, he may not have been able to be killed. And he can't succumb to a disease, but he's just going on, you know. (laughs) And I don't know that he'll have to die again. He might. He might have to be killed again. But it does say in Hebrews that it is appointed for men in general to die once. Of course, there are special cases uh, where people have had to die twice. But in general, you know, I mean, we know people that were raised from the dead and then they then, of course, they are, you know, they probably had to turn around and die again. Mm. So, um, wow. it's an interesting topic, though. Yeah, I was going to ask you that about the death. Is, do we only die once? That's why I was going to say, is that why people think Moshe is a, a witness? Because didn't they say there's no record of him dying? They never found him? Moshe? Well, it doesn't, uh, it does say that he died and then oh, Yahusha okay. or Yahua buried him in a, in a secret place where he would not be no, no, no one would be able to find him because otherwise it would be a, a huge you know place where people would go and, yeah. but uh, Yahusha thought a lot of Moshe and he, he wouldn't let him go in because he had disobeyed him and struck the rock instead of speaking to it and, but uh, In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28, it said, Just as man is destined to die once, and after that, face judgment. And then, uh, of course, we... uh, I'm going to close that, okay. So Mashiach was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation or deliverance to those who are waiting for him. And um, so it does say that we die once. Of course, that flies in the face of the Buddhists and the Hindus who are teaching, uh, you know, reincarnation, you know, because uh, Yahukanan or Eleazar was not 
put into a different body. He was in the same body. When he came out of that tomb that he was in, he was all wrapped up. And, you know, the people were freaking out, probably going, there's a guy that's dead. <laughs> Here he comes. He wasn't, he wasn't reincarnated. <laughs> no, not in a different body, you know. But uh, you, when Yahushua says, come forth, uh, he doesn't have to say it loud. He doesn't have to say it twice. You know, he's the creator, you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, just identifying somebody like that is pretty fun, though. And uh, noticing if a person does go to the, the book and they look for it, the name of the person that wrote it and they see it written at the beginning, this is the book of John or the gospel according to John. Well, it's just not in the text, you know. Hmm. But... Uh, Apparently, someone long ago had figured it out that that's who it really was, and he had that other name. And that's why the writer of Revelation is also mentioned. And, uh, you know, you could put it together. It's, it's a little bit of a puzzle, but it's pretty clear that Elazar is the real person that we're talking about, Miriam and Martha's brother. And he was very close to them. And of course, uh, you've also identified that wherever the gospel is spoken, we should always be speaking about um, Miriam. Yes. That's, a, Miriam, that's how you know it's a true testimony. Yeah, he said wherever this, this message or the Besora is, is spoken, that what she did would also be mentioned. And I try to bring that up in a few articles and certainly the book Fossilized Customs and that if this is not the true message then why am I mentioning that, you know? And you don't hear it mentioned in others, you know, hardly at all. Never. I had never. So when I had I've done all my research and all the people that were trying to say, we've got the gospel, well, it didn't mention her, you know. And uh, this little family must have been, uh, or still is, very important to him. So... Uh, that's uh, where you reckon he used to stay and uh, mm -hmm. the Yahushua used to come through every time he was passing through he'd stay with them mm -hmm. yeah it's not far from uh, the city of Yerushalayim you know mm. it, it, it isn't far at all so uh, Bethany you know yeah. actually Bethany is a I'd, I'd done a little research on that city and it seems to be a mysterious word that no one really knows the meaning of it necessarily, but it's Beth Anya, and it doesn't have the name in it as it sounds like, but Beth Anya means house of figs or something like that. You know, the house of figs. It's just what this little town was called. And uh, it was very important to the, the priesthood because they had a little installation there, you know, and a little judgment seat for people that would uh, have to be put outside the camp, you know, like especially like a priest that was unclean. So they would go to this place in Bethanya, they call Bethany, and uh, and remain there until they were clean, you know. And certain judgments that had to be made that were about uncleanness because they didn't want them to come into the temple area, uh, being in their state of uncleanness. So Beth Anya, or Bethany, was a functioning place outside the camp of the temple area uh, during the, the, when the temple was standing. So it had a functional mm -hmm. place. It was a very important place. People mm -hmm. read about Bethany all the time, and they probably don't know much about it. Not, not that I do either, but it's just that there seems to be a real connection there with the priesthood too and the functioning of the priesthood wow. mm -hmm. well I thought it would be great to discuss Yehukanon or Elazar because uh, a couple of weeks ago you mentioned him in the two resurrections and uh, yes, yes. We, I thought it would be important for you to blow people's brains with that little gem <laughs> yeah. Well, that's uh, the amazing thing is when they start reading John chapter 21, it's just going to just jump out at them and they're going to go, "Wow, this is this this is real." They were even speaking about it then that hey, that one's never going to die. 
and they were saying it, and he wrote it down that they were saying it, you know. And then we hear about and him, if, yeah. Huh? And if it, if it was if it was if it was like an error, Yahushua would have went. And that's not what I meant, mate. No, that's not what I meant. Right. You know, he would have. Yeah. He w he wasn't going to have them walking around with falsehood. So. And then we got this place here. You know, we we know that John was, or Yahushua was here. You know. Yeah. Mm. And uh, and if they try and boil you twice in oil and it doesn't work, that's pretty much a. You no. can't live with your flesh burnt off, can you? It was three times. Three three times. Yeah, they tried. It didn't work. Yeah. First time didn't work. Okay, let's do it again. Mm. And then now they didn't work. Well, maybe we're not doing something right. Is that check that water? Or check that oil. And then they probably really roared it up. You know, getting it really hot. And uh, it didn't work the third time. So they said, "Well, that's it." <laughs> A couple of the soldiers had to put their hands in to test it. They got no. Oh hands. boy! Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, it's a mystery. Yeah. But uh, something else you said uh, during the two resurrections hit me at one point because I don't know about most people, but myself and uh, others I talked to were like, well, we're trying to push for the first resurrection. We've got to overcome. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. And and you said something in that two resurrections where you said. We must be the first fruits. We must be because who else knows about this? Who else wants to get the seed out there? Who who else is trying to carry people in on their back to the wedding feast? And that sort of struck me like we are. We are the first fruits. So yeah. my question is, you don't have any doubt in your mind, do you, that you you mm. are part of the first fruits? It's not a because I get pestered. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. it is a, an encouraging thing to to know that you are, but it isn't about being uh, trying to make yourself better. It's actually the mm -hmm. the spirit that you have in you that reveals that to you, and it isn't about you anyway. It's the message that is being carried, and uh, as long as we have breath in us, what is most important is the eternal salvation of not us, but of others that can be reached. And if we just look at the, not, not that we're to look back, because we're not worthy of the, of the, of the reign of Yahuwah if we look back and say, well, I don't see much going on here. Because, you know, in this city where I'm at, there's nothing that I've been able to do to awaken, but just a few people, you know. But, you know, Yahushua is going to shake the universe. And I think there's going to be something that's going to happen then. And then when we become just like beams of light, and then people might go, wait a minute, what happened there? <laughs> then we'll be able to reach them, you know, because they'll listen to us now. And maybe some, some of them will remember, hey, that's that guy or that girl that I remember so, said something to me once, and it must be true. You know, some of these people will not believe no matter what miracle is done before their very eyes. They are so blinded by what they've chosen to live and believe, you know. After, I talk to them all the time. You know, they're really, really locked away in a prison of their own thing, of their own making, you know. They are very close-minded, you know. <laughs> and it's so sad to watch. But, uh, you know, when, when the world really does start getting to the point where, well, even then, a lot of people won't believe it. They'll just curse Yahuwah because they'll perceive him as an enemy rather than someone that loves them dearly and died for them. But, you know, he will make their, uh, if, if they're going to reject the blood of the Messiah, you know, then it's, a, it's, a, it's, the, it's the worst thing that a person can possibly do. And say, no, I just didn't hear it. Well, the ones that haven't heard will be, will be told, you know. The uh, message. Oh, conscious choice. Yeah, they, all the people really generally hear is the false message, you know. And it's so artificial and uh, it's not even reality, it's just religion, you know. Mm -hmm. See, because we're, we're, we're living in a reality, though. See, we're experiencing this. It's something that you, you uh, not that experience, experiencing miracles are, are necessary, but we're giving the insight, we're given the insights to understand and we're motivated in our hearts to obey. And that's the evidence that faith brings, you know. And the evidence of uh, our 
faith is of course what we what we practice and when we obey the commandments then that evidence is that we have the faith the ones that do not obey have not been given the faith they've been given something else you know some other thing but what they've accepted is not truth you know i, I sent a, a, an email over to you earlier today about the wineskins that people are you know did you get a chance to see that we just got up. That's right. We got up about an hour before the show. So right. You know, I haven't checked the emails yet. Yeah, so everybody's walking mm-hmm. around in wineskins. Their, their, their uh, hearts are wineskins that they have treasured away what their belief system is and their, their traditions of men. And what has mm-hmm. to happen is they, ha- they, can, they don't want to accept the real truth that's the person of Yahushua who brings to them all these interesting bits and they it just bounces off of them and they go well i'm happy with my wine my old wine is working and those are the teachings of men and what you have to do is shed the wine that you've been taught entirely and i remember when i had to just give it all up and then just take in the new wine into it and because he made me a new wine skin to accept it a new heart you know, a new mind. And the instead of the mind of the flesh, he gave me a, a mind of the spirit. And it was able it was able to come in and, and I could accept the new teachings that he had to bring to me. And of course, those teachings flow back out into the world. The truth. And the other wineskins that are filled with the traditions of men and the teachings of men, the old wine, they don't want to hear it either. No, don't bother my wineskin. I'm fine. I'm happy with this. I had my religion all figured out before you were born. And how do you reach those? You know, you're too young to know. Well, I remember, you know, when I was around your age and I was trying to appeal to my parents. And they said, oh, no, I'm too old to learn new things. You know, it's over. But I yet I reach people that are in their 80s that are calling or writing and they are 70s and 80s and 90s and they're saying, I'm so glad I've got to know this. This is wonderful to know. And they want to just chat about it. You know, they're happy. But it's not, it isn't, it doesn't matter what age you are because you're, that's just your body. And your wine skin is your heart, your mind, that the inner you, you know, the real you. And uh, he'll shed, he can let you renew that mind, you know, and then throw the old wine out. Just say, well, whatever you were taught about steeples and bunny rabbits and trees and birthdays, about uh, all that stuff, just throw it away. Take out the trash and hold on to what is good and study that, you know. But, uh, you know, and, and what we've brought up today is is very uh, a much part, a part of uh, some people might resist and they'd say, well, wait a minute, that's too, that's too weird, you know. But it's true, you know. So we've been so brainwashed coming out of Christianity that we've always been taught we've got a certain amount of time and then it's the end. Heaven or hell, deliverance or up or down. <laughs> and a certain amount of time and then that's it. Even the Christians are taught that. Um, yeah. But you're saying as far as the Yahushua coming back and us being transformed that time... Well, in order for there to be another thousand years of rest, time must continue the same, mustn't it? Because the last 6,000 years have passed with the same seven-day week time, minutes, hours, you know, kind of. So the next thousand years, in order for it to be a seven-year, 7,000-year block, the time would have to go on. People would have to survive whatever catastrophes happen on the earth to see us, if we make it, transform. And... So that's, that's a blowout. So people will... That's going to be a totally new way of Yahushua convincing people again. Well. So these people just these people just start shining. Mm, yes. That's, that's, that's freaky. Well, it is to us in this, in this particular time. But in, in, if we just go ahead a few years when Yahushua returns and, and we're ruling and reigning with him over the earth, we're not going to be in heaven. That's what, what's the point of that? You know, what? Where is that? It's everywhere. Every, the heavenly area is all around us even now, and uh, but the earth is going to go on, and 
the few that were able to survive the, the great tribulation and, and the coming of Yahuwah will be reproduced in numbers and then we will be helping them. The dragon will be bound and we're going to have a, a wonderful time, you know, explaining things to them because, but even then it's, the, it's still going to be the mind of the flesh that we'll have to help them overcome. But the mind of the spirit right now is poured out on the earth right now. And all people have to do is just accept him. And he's the, he is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And when that life comes into you, it isn't like, well, I'm not really sure if it's there or not. It is. It's because you don't value your own salvation as much as you do that of others that are lost. I'm talking to people that are dead all the time. And I have more concern for them than I have for myself, you know. That has, I, I'm out of the picture. In fact, at one time, before my conversion, I was worried about my own salvation and wondering how in the world am I going to be able to manage this? And, I, and it turns out that I don't. It's managed for me. And uh, it's wonderful. I don't have to worry. It's not in my department. It's not something I have to concern myself with. And neither do we concern ourselves with one another in terms of the job that you're given and the job that another is given or myself, we're operating on different planes completely. And sometimes we intersect with each other and go, how's it going there? How's it, you know, we're just passing one another in the, in the garden. And as we're planting, Ships yeah, the we're planting seed mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we're not supposed to be seeing somebody doing something different and hitting them over the head with our shovels and going, what are you doing? You're doing it all wrong. I'm just doing what the master told me to do. Well, you're not going to make it, buddy. You know, <laughs> you know that's uh, what. Uh, and we're all at different levels, too, of, uh, in, of, our, of knowledge. But even a person that's at a very low level of information, if they're doing what they're told to do, then who are we to, mm. to step in and try to say, wait a minute, you know. You know, I mean, of course, there's doctrinal errors and things. We can tell them and then go on, you know, say, well, you know, it's not about the moon. Uh, that's not set in the weeks. Really? Okay. And then move on. And then, you know, but whatever. There's uh, people that are, uh, I'm not judging anybody. I'm just wanting to express what Scripture has to say about a topic and, and then move on, you know. And, and mostly it's strongholds. The stronghold of this, the stronghold of that. Oh, I'm working right now on the next, uh, the next seminar, and I feel like we haven't really covered enough the topic of the stronghold of the bunny rabbit thing, you know, and how they took the E A S T E R name, and so I'm I'm going to have another seminar on that and see if we can. Try to cover that a little bit better. That's a stronghold, too, you know. Just mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, any other stronghold. It's an overcoming of a thought process, yeah. you know. And the things that people do, the, the time they do it. What It's actually a Babylonian custom, you know. And people don't know they're doing it, you know. Mm. It's good that you're going back and doing these because it's the people... So sometimes they're packaged differently or marketed differently and people haven't seen or heard you speak about those things. It's very important. Yeah. Sometimes people like to read mm. and others like to view. You know, uh, I think uh, there's, I don't know what the percentage is, but sometimes people like to read and they can pick up a copy of a, a book or two. Uh, uh, Brother Ed Nidal is going to be working on a new book uh, pretty soon. Uh, somewhat about the same topics as Fossilized Customs deals with. And that'll be a, a really good thing because having a different perspective on something, even though you're reading about the same thing, it's good to revisit it. And, you know, uh, mm. and, uh, you know, people can look on the Internet and find a lot of things and they can find out uh, whether or not something really is true or not, you know, about a particular topic like the, the, the Christmas tree or why people color eggs and hide them uh, and what the rabbits are and all that. But, uh, you know, they have a nice little way of, of shifting the, the thinking on things. You know, it's syncretism, you know. It's always been that way, though, you know. 
Yeah. But it's it, the basis and the truth. The resurrection is a real thing. When all those people were there watching, and I think it's John chapter 11, what we talked about, and all these people were there, unbelievers and believers both, that were, some of them were not believers in Yahushua at all. And they saw this dead man get up out of the tomb. And it wasn't a magic trick. They knew him. You know, that was amazing. You know. And he waited four days so that they would be no yeah, doubt. no doubt. They said, in fact, uh, his mm -hmm. sister said, uh, oh, surely he's going to be smelling by now, you know. You know, so they were really, really concerned. And, uh, but he came out of there. Nobody said anything. They smelled anything, you know. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. But uh, one of the things that, I, I, if I ever did bump into Elazar, just out here in the world, I'd, I'd like to ask him a lot of questions, you know, mostly about Yahushua, you know. But I'd like to, to know what he was seeing when he was in the grave, if he even knew anything. He'd probably say, no, nah, it's just like going to sleep, and then you wake up, you know. <laughs> you know. Now, some of the people that are watching this are dying. They're not but hours or weeks or days away from their own death. And I'd like them to understand that Yahushua is with you even when you pass through the valley of the shadow of death because he is the resurrection and the life, you know. So don't worry, you know. Uh, it's just the, 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 the sad thing about dying, though, is some deaths are not pleasant because they're, they're very painful. But then again, at some point, you will lose consciousness and you'll drift away. And then one day, it'll seem like you just went to sleep. You'll wake up, and you'll be there with him, you know. And it'll be wonderful. Yeah. He'll have given you a new body, a body that's immortal, that doesn't have to, you know, get cold and hot and worry about things like boiling oil or, uh, you know. Yeah. And uh, time will just pass, and you'll look just great. Yes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> wow but uh, yes it is mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I know that there's a lot of fear in people about, de about death and some people want to kill themselves because they just don't want to endure the, the thing anymore it's just so you know but don't do that you know just let you just turn That's yourself amazing. over to him yeah we found out last night what's behind suicide with um, we did an off and off the cuff really? last night, and uh, we were talking about talking about the the two thousand was it spirits that were inside the man um, that Yusha got off the boat and saw the man with at the, the gather in, and uh, two thousand spirits uh, went into the pigs. Pigs can't handle that; committed suicide, <laughs> and so we know we know where suicide comes from. Yeah, that was the point of. Some of the people refer to that gentleman as the Gadarene demoniac. You know, like a maniac, only a demoniac. Gadarene demoniac. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was a whole herd of pigs. And uh, they were being watched over or shepherded. And obviously it was a, it was a place of un unbelievers. You know, the Gentiles were there and they were, you know, shepherding pigs and raising them to apparently to eat and you and you Yahusha knew what was going to happen you know and he went oh, i don't want them eating that and <laughs> they went down and drowned they just rushed in one giant full bore herd down into the water and drowned every one of them there wasn't one that mm. was left that's amazing yeah. but where'd the demons go yeah exactly. see that's what's got me worried mm. So, if I if I speak to Yahusha <clears throat> about a, a possible demonic activity around anywhere, it doesn't have to be near. It could be far away. If I'm if I'm given to pray, I like to add that those demons come out of that person, and they be sent into a place of holding until the last day. So I like to ask him to put them there. Yeah, and I think he will. You know. So if we ever we don't speak to the demons though, he does. 
but we don't. We speak in the name of Yahusha to Yahusha. May this happen in your name, and because He's He's in us, and we allow His power to do that. But some people have that ministry or that work that they have to do, and it isn't just their their job. It's a, you know, it's a an ability that He's given them, a gift, you know. And of course, sometimes people use a gift only once. And, you know, a gift of healing would be good, you know, to be able to help somebody that was on, the, on, the, on their deathbed, mm -hmm. be able to lay hands on them and, and see them recover, you know. Those are gifts that, yeah. You heard, about it. you heard about anybody lately who just lays hands on somebody and heals them? No, no. Cast the demon No, but I know it happens. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm not looking for works. See, I'm not collecting data on that. You know? No, no, no. But that's only because I don't know. You know? No, but it's like, it's encouraging oh, yes. though, isn't it? It is. It means his body's functioning. Yes. <laughs> yes, the body's working. Do you think? The body's out there doing things. And, uh... If things like that happen. I know one time that uh, it happened uh, for someone that I love, and I laid hands on them, and they got better. And, uh... They were in really bad shape. There was not much hope. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, I would love to be able to be told by Yahushua to just go into the hospital and, and just put hands on people and lay, raise them up. I haven't been told to do that, though. You know, but if somebody is, they should do it, you know. Yeah. Amazing. When you said don't speak directly to uh, evil spirits, where's... That example's from, uh, was it Daniel? Or was it Michael? Michael, the uh, archangel, was told not to. Well, we don't speak, we well, don't he, speak back. Well, the book of uh, first, first Peter or Second Peter discusses that, that they don't uh, speak badly of the, of the demons or, you know, the fallen messengers. They, they just, uh, you know, they don't speak disrespectfully. They... Uh, because these creatures are creatures, but they're uh, creatures with incredible energy and power in, in themselves, and they are a higher form of life than us. But uh, although their end is not going to be a pleasant one, you know, it's not for us to judge them, mm -hmm. and it isn't for, it's for Yahushua to deal with them. And we, all we can do is appeal to him through prayer, you know. The authority... Mm -hmm is all in him and you know we just basically obey him and we don't like he was he told peter you you follow me don't worry about them you know and i don't really have any uh, mm. real research to draw from about case examples in scripture of anyone insulting a demon but uh there was the the donkey that 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 was in the in the case of uh, Balaam that had uh, stopped and you know he was whipping the thing making it go trying to make it go and you know you, you just don't want to go against you know something that's a spiritual creature you know you just you can just simply take authority over something in in, in the name of Yahusha and and speak to him May you who should do this or do that, but you know I wouldn't address a demon. You know, we're not to speak to spirits. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Deuteronomy 18, we're not to consult or have conversations with them. Deuteronomy 18, or you know, mm -hmm. and then you have uh, Yeshayahu chapter 8. You don't pray to the dead. You don't pray to spirits. Um, you know, so. These are just a couple of places. I know there's probably many examples that we could probably pour through the scriptures and look for, but uh, yeah, you wouldn't want to be messing with uh, uh, spiritual matters, mm -hmm. like and say, "Well, I'm going to make that my." You know, you, you you know, you don't just you're not going out picking what your mission is. He gives you the mission by equipping you with the toolbox that he's given you to do. You know. The things that I have to do, I'm equipped to do, you know. See, if I was given the toolbox that I've been given and I work somewhere else other than where I'm at, then I would probably get fired the first day, 
by my employer. Yeah. Uh, they'd, they'd just call me over to the side and they'd say, well, we, uh, we don't want you uh, discussing these matters at all with the uh, clientele. And I'd say, oh, well, I have to. I can't stop. You know, but anyway, then I'd, get, I'd lose my job the first day or two, or certainly in the first week. But uh, where I'm at right now, there's a whole parade of people coming in from all over the uh, world, even, especially the United States. And they're just passing through, and they're just in there. It's like a tourist trap, or a little tourist shop, you know. And they're passing through, and I'm yeah. handing them something, or they're going on, and I'm giving them uh, a little information, or they bump into it, and, and you know, they, it just travels away. I don't know where it's going, you know. And then, uh, you know, you sometimes meet people that you planted seed in, and they call you back. And then suddenly, years later, they're writing books <laughs> on the topic. You know, it's and I could cite their names. I don't want to embarrass them, but you know, people that uh, yeah. you'd be amazed. Yeah, you just never know what you're going to be used to do and what's ahead. Just keep planting and don't keep look. Don't look back over your shoulder. Say, well, how's that going back there? You know, just move on and keep doing it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say. Bef- I was gonna say before people don't. Um, when you're talking about people hitting each other with shovels, people don't seem to understand that um, your opinion about a subject means absolutely nothing to someone else. People are modelling themselves after the world or the mindset they've always had or the people around them, and they think that when they talk, it means something. They think that everybody's. They've, they've got this idea that they've got an audience that there's a stage and everybody's just listening to them intently. Nobody cares what you have to say. Nobody cares what you think. So you telling Lou or telling me or telling somebody that you're not supposed to, you know, unless you come to somebody in love and say, brother, I've got a concern, can you help me? And unless you or I, I mean, nobody responds to anything but love these days. They, they, don't, they don't care what you have to say. And particularly a fellow believer, like they're not going to, you hit them over the head with your shovel and say, you're not supposed to do that. They don't care. Nobody cares what you have to say these days. They're just words. And, and in a world where there's just so much verbal abuse, people have learned to turn it off in their head. So I know myself, if, if anybody says anything to me, I, that's probably one or two, three, maybe four mm-hmm. people in my whole life who could say something to me and it would just cut straight into my heart because they've proved mm-hmm. that they've suffered me enough yeah. That, yeah. that they love me. You know, they put up with me so much that I know that what they've said is worthwhile. But nobody, you know, have you found that? It is. Oh, it's an hour, brother. Is it a time up? <laughs> it's getting ready. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know. In this in this country, <laughs> there's a couple of generations of people that have come up in their lives from young people that have been taught by the school system and the environment and just socialized in such a way that they can't you know handle criticism because they were all coddled and carefully protected from anything that might be judgmental or oh you can't you can't talk bad about that or that or any other all the topics are all you know un, unmentionables so everybody wins the the same everybody's at the same level academically and uh, everybody w- gets a, an award. There's no achievement. Everybody's basically just the same. But that's not true in real life because everybody has a, has their own special gifts. And a person can excel in an area and another person can excel in another area. And they should receive admiration for that. But they're not allowed to in, in, in the way they're, they're doing things. And what's happening is it's produced... A, a couple of generations of people, like Adam was talking about last night, of people are just so insulting to, to one another now and critical about anybody making a criticism. In other words, they're, they're intolerant of intolerance. And then they're mean and mean-spirited. And you see it on Facebook all the time. People are just unkind and to each other, you know. Because you can't, you know, like you were saying, no, no one seems to care about what other people think and I think that 
it's because of this uh, environment that they're raised in. It may be happening in more places than just our country, you know. But anyway, yeah. Okay. Well, it's about about time up, I guess. Eh? Mm -hmm. Hold on. All right. I just want to check. I want to check this. Oh, you've only got one minute left. On we have day. one minute left. Did you want to go on? <laughs> well, I had. To, yeah, because okay. I had a couple of positive questions, questions I needed to ask we'll you. Do a. Yeah. He wants. He wants to ask him some questions about Passover. Okay. Yeah. Just... Now these questions. Uh, is that all right? What? Is that all right, boss? Is everything all right, boss? He can't hear you. All I, oh, yeah. I can hear you in my head. <laughs> can he hear me? <laughs> yeah, he says everything's good. He could put the other earbud in, but then we, <laughs> it would look like there's a two-headed person here. You know, that's not right. I only have. Do you have two earbuds? I do, but I, I taped the other one back there so that it wouldn't that, get in yeah. my way. Yeah. Before we finish, brother, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about um, Passover this year. Um, yeah. According to the, I'll just make it simple. According to the dates you gave me, on the fifth of the fourth, of, uh, fourth month, on yeah. the fifth it's a memorial night, and on the sixth it's the Passover meal, the beginning of of matzah or unleavened mm. bread. So there's two nights. And I just want to make it, people who are getting it mixed up, matzah, unleavened bread, Passover, there's all these terms and people are getting, they just want to know, what do I do on the first night and what do I do on the second night? Because some people don't even know there's two nights. So on the first night is like a memorial night and it's all about Yahushua, isn't it? you got your, your foot washing, you got your bread and your wine. And then the second night is about the lamb, isn't it? About the coming out of Egypt um, and you've got your... Like your feast. I mean, Phyllis said last week you don't have to have a lamb if you don't want to, but because Yahushua's the lamb. So there's two nights. One's about Yahushua and one's about the lamb, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so, I don't have the uh, scriptures exactly where we... Uh, uh, they're not in front of me, but I do know that Yahuwah has prescribed that no one is allowed to slaughter uh, an offering of any kind outside of where he placed his name. So we can't do that just wherever we want willy-nilly, especially being that we're in captivity, in the scattering of the nations. So that is not allowed. But a lot of people will say, oh, he's, he's established his name where I am, and so I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to kill a lamb. Now, you can slaughter a lamb for a meal. That's perfectly kosher. You know, but uh, if you're doing it to obey the commandment to slaughter a lamb, then that's done by the priests. That And we are Melchizedek, but we are Mel Melchizedek priesthood order. But uh, the fact is the the sacrifices or the, 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 you know, the actual sin offering has been done. And, hmm. and it has to be done according to the pre prescribed order of the uh, scriptures. And... Uh, Yerushalayim is where he says he's placed his name forever. He didn't say he was going to place his name in many places. It's in that place, and that's where it is. But uh, if you're living in some place like Texas, and you say, well, he's placed his name in my heart. Well, that is true. He lives in you. But, you know, you're not supposed to be slaughtering an animal as a sin offering. And that's what the lamb re represents, because... And it's an atoning offering. And it was done one time, you know. But anyway, that's something that we... Now, we might have lamb or we might not, but we'll have a... We probably... Uh, traditionally, what we do is we have a grilling. Uh, so, uh, you know, we get a grill and we get the coals real hot and then we put the shish kebabs up there, you know, put the meat on the stick or one of these uh, metal rods and put some onions and tomatoes and... Uh, green onions and things and and just sort of make this beautiful thing but uh, we we do have a meal but uh, you know we will do it uh, at the beginning of the 14th as a memorial of his death you know but that lamb is not the lamb we might be eating is not the lamb you know that's just the meal that we're having but we're remembering what he did and uh, we usually sprinkle some wine on a parsley or something and splatter it up on the doorpost and the lentil 
of a of a house of our of our house as a remembrance for the children because they see it and they go well we're doing this and maybe later as they grow up they'll remember that that's what the Israelites did um, so you know that's basically it is there any details that you wonder about well you just said that you do that as a memorial of his death isn't the memorial the night before at the beginning of the 14th isn't that what you're referring to yes yeah that's so, mm-hmm. the night of the vigil you, isn't really... You have your feast the next night, isn't it? Isn't the night of the vigil just your foot washing, your bread, your wine, you stay up all night? Yes. And then the, and then the next night is the first right. day of... First that day. That night is the, of, mat, of uh, unleavened yeah. bread. That's when you have your feast, isn't it? Right. The beginning of the 15th... Of course, we do both nights, you know, but yeah. for different reasons. One is to remember Yahusha's day of suffering, because he suffered and died on the 14th as the lamb, and he hung on the torture stake for about six hours, and then died and was put in the tomb just before the sun set. They had to hurry because the high Sabbath was approaching. That's an, an interesting thing. Now, some people get disturbed about what day of the week that was, that he did it. And it is relevant to the sign of Yonah. What day of the week that happened and then how many days and nights he was in the tomb. And they were complete days and complete nights. And then he rose, apparently, at the end of the weekly Sabbath. And then, or at the beginning of the first day or whatever, but it wasn't Sunday morning. But it was definitely, he was going back to work, you know. So the, the Catholics that say that, well, that's the day he rose on Sunday. Well, technically, uh, that, that's wrong according to their own timekeeping. Because they don't start their day until midnight. And he came out of the tomb three days and three nights later. And it certainly wasn't the F day that they call it, you know, because that would not have been the sign of Yonah. See, the three days and three nights is that he said, you will be given only the sign of Yonah. And the sign of Yonah was a type of resurrection too. Hmm. You know? Well, you can, um, we'll, we'll, we'll work out all the slides and we'll, we'll go through the whole lamb uh, legacy and yeah. the sheep and doves and goats and all sorts of things that you went through. Because some of that went over my head, I think, last time I went through the lamb legacy thing. So, uh-huh. Right in time for Passover, we'll rehash the um, some of those slides, and we'll so people can get grasp just the fulfillment mm-hmm. of Yahusha's mm-hmm. sacrifice. But the other thing I want to ask you was, um, uh, we've told we we've told people over the years that three times a year you have to gather together. If you're in the vicinity of other believers, you have to gather together. Um, do you have to? And which night would that be? Well, you're, during the Feast of Matzah, we're to get together, and that would be uh, a, 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 an assembling together at uh, the beginning and the, and the ending of Matzah, mm-hmm. you know, and some people camp out for the whole week together, yeah. and that's great. Uh, mm-hmm. If something was like that going on around here, that would be great. I can't take vacations. I, I just don't. Yeah. I take off the, yeah. my vacation is once, one day a week. You know, yeah. so I get 52 days off every year. So, uh, but, uh, and then of course the other high Sabbaths, of course, as well, I get those off too. Uh, so w- the three times though would be matzah and that would be on the 15th, of course. And then seven days later on then too, we should get together with other believers and it only takes two or three to gather for him. He said, Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, then I am there. So we don't have to have a minion of at least ten people, or you know, like the the mm-hmm. Yahudim have traditionally taught. But you know, and then of course we're supposed to meet together in the uh, book in Leviticus twenty three and Deuteronomy sixteen. You can read when, when these things are to be. Uh, Shabuoth is another one. And then the Feast of the End Gathering are tabernacles. So we don't have to meet on Yom Kafar or Yom Teruah, you know. But we do have to meet for Sukkoth or tabernacles. And if we have a believer that's nearby, 
then we would, why wouldn't we want to be with them? In fact, uh, it wouldn't do any harm for them if they were within walking distance, you know, to just come over and spend a little time with you, unless uh, they were there for hours and hours and hours. Because then they are, then their foot is in your, in your house, uh, if they were there every week, for example. Unless you're discipling them, and you could do that any day of the week, you know. So you would encourage people uh, that you're teaching or knowing in your shop or anything that you, if they lived around about near you, you would say, look, it's this is the time of the feast. We are to gather together. Right. Come on over. Let's gather together. Right. So you you would be you would say that to people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If if that if that yeah. was possible. Yeah. There's a lot mm. of people that misunderstand things that I'm saying. You know, but if you uh, feel like you need to go to be in the presence of an elder, for example, on a particular day, so you have to drive through city after city until you reach that elder, then you might be a little out of touch with what Scripture shows you, but you can do that, but you're not offending anybody, but you're not required to be there, you know. A lot of times people will go to an assembly and they're several hundred miles away, and then they set themselves up a bunch of, uh, you know, it's like a huge uh, family gathering, and that's wonderful. I, I'd love to be able to go to something like that, but I, I have to pretty much get back to work again because the economy here is so bad, you know, that I my day job is requiring me to be there, and I can't just, I can't even take a week off, you know. Hmm. It's, it's tragic. So if you had people two minutes or five minutes or ten even 20 minutes away, yeah. people living around you, you would feel quite comfortable saying, look, yeah. we're commanded to gather three, three times a year, yeah. and this is one of them. Exactly. So we've got to get yes. together. Your place or mine. Yes, right. <laughs> and, and just yeah. meet for you know, a while and, and, and have a, yeah. a little fellowship. You know, so that, and then people can ask questions and, and get a little bit of stirred up about uh, what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to understand things. Because, you know, whenever we come together, everything should be done for one purpose, and that's education, you know? Mm. We're not coming together to do anything but obey and, 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 and learn. Obey and learn. And those two things, you know, will eventually enable a person to... <laughs> that's quite right. Come, Richard. I'm plugged into the chair. <laughs> That's it. Sorry. Go on. Anyway, uh, so if we get together, we're obeying him first. That's what worship is. Obeisance or obed, obad, comes from, it gives us our word obey. So that's what worship is. When you translate the word obad from Hebrew into English, it's worship. So we worship yeah. by obeying. That's what it is. And then as we, like just what I just explained, that is a form of education. And so what we come together to do is to be educated so we can know what we're doing. And uh, if we're told to not obey, a lot of times I'd be sitting in a Christian assembly and the preacher would be up there speaking against the law, the, well, the instructions of Yahuwah. We don't have to obey. And I'm going, what? Where does it say we don't have to obey? You know. And yet they're saying it. And then they speak out of both sides of their mouth and they say, well, you can't do this because then you're, you're not going to be, you have to keep this um, Christian stuff going, you know. You have to tithe. You have to tithe. <laughs> well, but you just said, we don't have to obey. And then yet now you're saying we have to obey. Only when it benefits <laughs> them. It's really unbelievable. You know, just they keep you away from the truth just enough to condemn you, you know, and, and before Yahuwah, but then they're getting rich as a result of that, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and people love that. I mean, they're going, oh, I feel like I'm doing something. I'm I'm participating. I'm I'm paying my way in, and and Yahushua's going to look at all that I've done for all these many years, mm -hmm. and I've been here every single week giving my money, and he, and he's going to go, what? I never told you anything about that you know I never told you to give that man anything you know so 
you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be utterly amazed and shocked, and they, they're going to say, well, you mean you want me to take the day off once a week? I could have done that. Why, why wasn't I told? You know, and then they get the wrong day, you know, or they're watching the moon and going, what? You know, it's just, uh, it's a mess. I tell you, there's all kinds of deceptions. Ah, the deceptions <laughs> are just, and the, and the sheep are going to just fall for the most stupid thing that comes along. You know, not that way. Why is that? Mm. You know, yeah. uh, I, I that's why mm. I, I trust somewhat in the older brother's understandings about things like the calendar. And there's people that say, no, I think we, they've got that wrong, and we're going to watch for the sliver moon. And okay, well, you know, that's fine. I don't. I'm not going to condemn anybody, but I'm just saying that when the older brother has been doing something for thousands of years then they might know when the new moon is, you know, and they might know when the full moon is, and they might know when the specific annual Sabbaths are. And they certainly do know when the weekly Sabbath is. No one's ever argued with any of the Yahudim in all of history. History has been completely silent about any Gentile getting in an argument with a Yahudi over what day of the week it was. You know, even the Gentile nations have over 200 words that are directly linked to the word Sabbath. You know, Sabato, uh, Shabua. Uh, no, uh, you know all those words, Sabatu and uh, Sabato is a Spanish word. You know, so they all name the day of the week that they call the goat legged man, the Seder day. You know, it's like, what? What? You know, that's wrong. So. If so if we're here to educate people, then you would be encouraging people then. I mean, a lot of people are isolated and they only have themselves. or yeah. And that's why we do a lot of these teachings and uh, speak Scandal. candidly so they can feel like they're more part of a family because we're all part of a f We're all together. We're brothers and sisters. Uh, some people are only husbands and wives and, and at yeah. least, you know, you've got somebody. But mm. if you, you, your instructions, you said you were into education, your instruction for people if they're, if they got people around them would be come together. Mm -hmm. Yes, and not only that, but you know, to understand what these things are representing is important mm -hmm. because even the Yahudim today, the rabbinical Jews or Judaism, they don't really know what these things are that they're doing. They're shadows of redemption. And they know that Passover was something that happened to them a long time ago. They don't realize that the Passover lamb was what that was pointing to. And they don't know anything about the first fruits being the resurrection. And they don't know about, you know, the waving of the barley. That, that's the resurrection. And they don't know much about even their own festival that they, they call Shabuoth, which was the giving of the Torah at Sinai, was reflected in the book of Acts, chapter 2, when the Spirit was poured out into them, into the first Nazarene and they were enabled to love the commandments and the commandments were written on their hearts they don't know this the Christians don't know it either that's what makes it so easy for us to explain it to them or difficult given the type of soil we're sowing in but uh, they don't know what these things represent these words like Yom Kippur Yom Kafar. They don't know what they mean or what they point to, you know. You know, Judgment Day and and the and Sukkoth or Tabernacles. They don't know what these things are. They're shadow pictures of, of redemption, you know. Hmm. The annual Sabbaths. Yeah. So just to rehash really quickly, on the on the first night you 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 just it's not really about the meal, you just sort of remember you who shall you have some bread and some wine, do you? And then That's you, what we have. You try matzah. Your, yep. Mm -hmm. And you try your best to stay up all night. Yes. Mm. And we remember what he did. We read the scripture of when he's doing, what he's doing with his disciples the night before he suffered. And then we read about his suffering. And then we, rep we see that the wine that we're drinking represents his blood. Not that it is his blood, but it represents it. And that he reminded us that he would not drink of it again until he did it when we have the, you know, the wedding feast. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you know, then the next night 
is the first night of a high Sabbath, or what they call a, in the Greek, it's megas. It's the word high or big. And it's an annual Sabbath. On the 15th day, the, the moon should be full. And that represents, you know, the time they came out of Mitzrayim or Egypt that on that night. And they plundered the Egyptians. And they left. And they had the light of the moon, you know. They were coming out of there. And uh, then the seventh day from that point is when the Egyptian army perished in the water. So they're reflections of things, and those are redemption things, too. There's things that the, the redemption has happened in the past, and then there's unfulfilled things. So a lot of these things have been fulfilled, and then there's still three more festivals that are yet ahead to be fulfilled, you know. Mm. But, so do, uh, you, um, do you make the first night just private with your own family and then have a big feast and anybody can come? that's around for the second one or do you just have a big shindig both nights well we have a private thing on the beginning of the first night okay like on it, when the 14th comes at the end of the 13th of the of the real moon hmm. and then we have a private thing in our home what, we, what they call a seder you know yeah it's not a long it's not a long seder it's just what we do is we read scripture we don't read a book you know it's just what we do it's our family tradition other people are following practices from rabbinical Judaism, and they have a, you know, a, a Haggadah, you know, a little thing that they go through. It could take uh, 10 minutes to half an hour or longer. Depends on what their Haggadah looks like. We don't do those things. They're man-made traditions, and we don't condemn them either. We, we could easily do them, and it wouldn't be sinful. Uh, but we just don't do that. We read Scripture. You know, we, we get this book. And uh, you read, read about the Jesus actual, death. yes, and we read part of of uh, Shemoth or Exodus, where they, uh, you know, are going through this this period of of turmoil when they come out of the land after the plagues hit, you know, and they were is basically that, being driven out. Is that about Exodus fifteen? Is it or? Oh yeah, certainly. Uh, right around there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you'd read Matthew 20, uh, yeah. 21, is it? 22? Well, it wasn't, it isn't quite that late. We start sooner than that. Okay. It's probably around chapter t uh, 12, uh, I thought, but yeah. uh, it's Shemoth or Exodus chapter 12, somewhere okay. in there. And then we just start reading and pick up spots and, and then we move into, you know, um, I think it's, what is it, John? John 16 or uh, well wherever wherever with the Last Supper is discussed okay. and then the execution of Yahushua and then uh, what it's what it's all about the lamb you know mm -hmm. so that's the 14th and he went through all this stuff at you know in the evening uh, and then all during the night and his arrest and then of course his execution in the morning and, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's a wonderful thing to go through it can take you know half an hour to an hour but it's not hurried through. It's just discussed. And so a lot of times we don't even uh, read that much. It's just a, it starts a conversation, you know, in the family, you know. And it's a family thing mostly. And then, uh, of course, if somebody was to be there that was a guest, that we'd say, well, you know, you're not immersed. You really can't participate if you're not immersed. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a, a, an important thing. They can't partake of the, of the cup. You know, and and the in the in the bread, if they're not immersed, yeah, you know, you'd be eating unworthily. Yes, yes, and there. This is a family thing, uh, corporately. You know, the the body of Yahusha. Now, um, and then on the beginning of the fifteenth, we uh, recognize the Sabbath. You know, it's a day of rest, but it is it is a cooking Sabbath, unless it happens to fall on a weekly Sabbath. But it, being a cooking Sabbath, it, you're able to prepare a meal, and that only. You can't go to work. It is a Sabbath this to... year. It's a weekly Sabbath it? this year, I think. Yeah. Okay, I haven't looked uh, recently. The first day, first day of Unleavened Bread is a weekly Sabbath this year, and then the seventh day is a uh, Yom Shishi. <laughs> <laughs> a 
I like that word. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, I love the way you say it. But uh, <laughs> Yom Shishi. Yom Shishi. Very, very awkward. Yeah. Just make sure you don't say Yom Shishi. You know? Yeah, that's that's a C, isn't it? Yes, a Yom yeah. is a sea or an ocean. Yom mm. is the day. We but were saying the word wadi last night. What's a wadi? Is that a river or a creek or? A wadi is, is a, a. It can it can have water in it or it can have no water in it. It's usually a, a channel, that where when it rains it really comes down and it'll be a place where the rain water goes and they harness the wadis to channel mm. the water into the mikvahs. Mm. You know, oh, and fill up the mikvah. You know, because yeah. mikvahs would get kind of low, and they'd say, "Well, we got to get this water in here," and then the rain would come. But uh, the, uh, it, you know, the processes that we're talking about are very mm-hmm. important to a person that's starting out, and they're looking yes. at the older people that have said, "Well, what do you, what do you do?" And you know, what we do is just what it says, and uh, no more, no less. Why I add to it? You can make little family traditions that are private to your family. Like I was mentioning, we put a little wine in a bowl, and we take some parsley, and we dip it in there, and we sprinkle it visually and literally on the doorpost and the lintel. And it was for the children to see that happening. So it would make the story, or the actually the record of the scriptures, come alive. You know, they'd see it right there happening, and they and it would make their their memory tie itself with their what they were hearing. Yeah, it does. You know, mm-hmm. so those are the kinds of things that I like to do, and mm-hmm. instead of just sitting there and making them squirm while somebody's reading this thing, you know, it's just wrong. <laughs> I don't like. I didn't ever like to just sit there and read and read and read and read, and mm-hmm. because the children need to get up and experience things you know yeah we're trying to teach them you know so and, if you read it's sorry if you read yeah. the um the account of the exodus and the uh the account of Yahushua's death on the first night do you read any torah the second night or is that really just a feast with believers oh yes we do we in fact we start with the annual festivals that are mentioned in leviticus 23 yeah. and or Deuteronomy 16 and it explains what we're doing on that night you know and uh, we also reflect on what it represents the departure from Egypt and by a mighty hand and a strong outstretched arm Yahuwah mm. rescued or redeemed Israel from that land of Satan you know yeah. Satan's power and then at this on the seventh night uh, of Matzah the last, the, the, the day that uh, is seven days away, what, what happens then is we remember what happened to the Egyptian army and how they were delivered and they came through the Yam Suf, the Sea of Reeds, and it, it was water standing on them on their right and their left like a wall, mm. and they were walking on dry ground. It wasn't muddy ground, but the, uh, <laughs> you know, it was dry. Every molecule of water was ordered out of there and uh, when the Egyptians came by their chariots were getting caught in the mud because obviously the water was coming back and oops it's a, you know and then they started slowing down and getting bogged down and then the water crashes in on them and it's over mm-hmm. even the Pharaoh himself apparently died in yes. that. There was cataclysmic. The, the strongest, mightiest army on the earth was annihilated by just the hand of Yahuwah. They don't have the Pharaoh die in any of the movies or cartoons, do they? He always seems to make it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, sometimes. I, I think I remember the Ewell Brenner was up there looking at looking on as the ocean went over, but I think he was one. It, it was the actual Pharaoh himself. He was, you know, crazy. He was Looney, Looney Tunes about this. He was really mad. Mm-hmm. and uh, crazed. And Yahuwah just drove him on to pursue the Israelites. And remember, the Israelites are Yahuwah's wife. Mm-hmm. You don't mess with his wife. Mm-hmm. You know? Excuse me. So uh, the leader Excuse me a second. Leader of Iran better watch out. Yeah. Excuse me a second. Yeah. There's a guy whippersnipping out the front across the road. Oh! <laughs> Can't stand it. They do it all Sabbath yeah. as well. Out there mowing their lawns and whippersnipping. 
You just want to go, hey, it's Sabbath. <laughs> oh. But you can't. Well, no, it's not It's not Sabbath there, is it? Not today, it's not. No, it's cool. Oh, okay. No, t- today's not. But they're whippersnipping on their Sabbath. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they can't help themselves. Well, that's great. That, uh, that's made the feast very clear. Yeah. I think yeah. everybody will understand now. If you can gather together, yeah. you should be gathering together. It's for your encouragement and education. It is. And, you know, if you videotaped uh, one of the gatherings uh, that you do, it would uh, probably help just uh, maybe five minutes or something of, you know, what your family does, which is an example. But uh, maybe Adam will do that one of these days. That would be fun. You know? Well, what I've realized is, um, you remember last year we put that little Passover thing up that Josiah recorded? Yes. With his voice? Uh, well, most of the video of it we had have to scrap because it was all Hollywood cartoons and things. So we have to scrap all that. But I've worked out a way to animate him. So uh, it'll still be his voice, but we can animate him so he can take us through Passover. Wow! And, uh, well, I and love the stuff it. that we filmed, the stuff we filmed live of us doing a Passover thing, we could still use that. That's fine. So yeah, bit of a Passover for what is it? What, is it, what are those books called? Passover for dummies. <laughs> oh, well, I really enjoyed uh, all that, and you know, even though it wasn't yeah. like maybe completely uh, permitted but it was just wonderfully done and this work that you've done recently has been amazing you know I don't know how you managed it's been, all, it's been a full on but I've really enjoyed going through all our old yeah. shows yeah. yeah seeing how we get used to each other and the, the context and the, the audio visual thing and everything yeah. it's been yeah. mm, very encouraging well in this past week adam has just added these incredibly bright lights i can barely yeah. open my eyes i need a i need a hat and sunglasses <laughs> and maybe a little pipe or something you know a little ship's captain pipe and uh, i don't know it's i need something i need some kind of goggles and i know what yeah. i really need is a welder's helmet yes <laughs> that would re- and then i could see you better yeah. but these lights are so bright. And um, he's put a green screen back here. It looks very flashy. Yes, it's very nice. <clears throat> so he's got this green screen and these nice lights. Yeah. They're they're diffusing, but really, really bright fluorescent lights. Yeah. So uh, you'll have to ask Anyway, him. we'll see how that works. You'll have to ask him to show you the video of himself testing the green screen. He won't show you, but I got to see it. Oh, <laughs> did you? Well maybe you could maybe you could send me a little email. Oh, I'll get in trouble. I'll get in trouble oh, from the, I'll get in trouble from the boss. <laughs> okay, we don't want to upset the boss. <laughs> I'll ask him and plead with him, and maybe you know at some point he'll break down and go, "Okay, Dad, yeah, I'll do it. yeah. just ask him to show you his neck dance." Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. Oh. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've seen Adam do some interesting things that he didn't see us right away. One day, <clears throat> when he was much younger. We had a, we were living in a in another place, and there was a, a little place where you could look through the wall into the other room, you know, a little pass through thing, and uh, he was in there doing this thing, and Phyllis and I were in the dining room looking through and going, and uh, we just, he he heard us stop talking, and then he looked over and he went, uh oh. He was so embarrassed. But he was just in there dancing away, you know. Yeah. Amazing. It's wonderful. He's a good dancer. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> we see him doing it still, too, from time to time. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful, brother. We'll call it a good day. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, uh, next week it's going to be Amy and Phyllis. People are loving that. You yes. Know? mm yeah, the uh, the radio people have been saying there's not enough ladies on the radio, so we're going to turn them into shows now for the radio. Okay. Very kind. Well, really enjoyed seeing you. Yeah, you too. Well, I'll see you in a couple of hours, probably. Oh yes, and I'll be up upstairs on my computer. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Probably. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm down here in my, in Adam's lab. Yeah. Well, so. I'm gonna tr- I'm gonna try and switch off my recording. So that it puts all the power into recording the two of you guys. Right. So um, okay. you may not even hear me, but I'll be, I'll be there. So. Okay. 
Thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining us on this uh, amazing tour talk. If you are around other believers, we encourage you to come together for the for the high sabbath it's very important for your education every year we learn something different don't we about it oh, that yeah. we didn't know yes so just by by obeying it yeah you learn something from inside the commandment yeah mm. so we love you thank you brother we love you all right thank you but brother yeah. bye bye see you later okay. Toy talk. Toy talk. I said